afternoon, everybody. Yes, so I'm Malcolm Frodsham. So I run Real Estate Strategies. Um, so we're basically, uh, uh, we do forecasting and also uh, risk management tools. And so uh, uh, this sort of flows from our asset allocation model and it sort of links together the, the sort of underwriting process for individual assets uh, and the asset allocation process. Excellent. So uh, yeah, as Sonia says, Plenty of time for questions, so just put your questions in or raise your hand and uh, we can take them as we go along. So let's just set the scene. So what is a sensitivity table? Um, well, it basically helps us understand our changes in rental growth and the exit yield affect the return on investment. So this is the sort of classic design. I'm sure uh, you've all dealt with um, very similar uh, examples. I've used the terms sort of weaker and stronger and lower and higher. Um, but you're basically looking at the the, the impact of a, a different rental growth scenario and a different exit yield scenario on the return that you're getting from the investment. So the nice thing about the sensitivity table is it's 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 very intuitive. So basically, if you get stronger rental growth and you get a lower exit yield, you're going to get your highest return. If you're going to get weaker rental growth and higher um uh, sorry, weaker rental growth and uh, uh, a higher exit yield, then you'll get your lowest return. And then you've got the sort of off diagonals. So it's a very intuitive. So that's very nice. Um, so the first consideration is, well, well, where do we get those boundaries? You know, I, I use words like lower and higher and weaker and stronger. Um, but where do those numbers actually come from? You know, how do we know how high rents can go or how our rents can fall how do we know if we've got the lowest possible exit yield or the highest possible exit yield um i think many many people underwriting over the last few years probably didn't expect yields to rise uh, as far as they have in the last uh, 18 months that's for sure so let's have a little think about these boundaries um so one thing we did is we had a little look back uh, using the MSCI series, uh, and we looked at retail, and we did rolling five-year time periods back to the year 2000. And we looked at the range. So we had the range of rental growth. So that went from about plus 4% per annum to minus 4% per annum. And then we looked at the yield change, so the yield shift. So that ran from sort of minus 8% per annum up to plus 7% per annum. So that's taking uh, what I would sort of call uh, an empirical approach. Now we did ask a question. We did ask a poll on this. So we asked on LinkedIn, how would you determine your range? And we did get a bit of a spread, including we had none of the above, but unfortunately we didn't get any comments telling us uh, uh, where, where, the, uh, where, the, uh, the, where they chose their boundaries from. However, empirical was top, which is fantastic. So we've got the, 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 the majority there. There were two other choices. Um, so one was taking a, a forward looking approach, and that was looking at the IPF consensus forecast. So that's very interesting because because obviously one of the things about using an empirical approach is that's the past. So surely you should be looking forward looking. So I do like the idea of having a forward looking component to how you calibrate your sensitivity table. And um, now a narrow range, more interesting. So we did have some respondents going for the narrow range. And that's that's often been sort of my issue. We, I tend to see that, you know, you get your average forecast for growth of, say, 2%, and then you've got sort of plus 1% and and, and uh, plus 3%, which is a which is a very narrow range. Um, I, would, I would suggest that that doesn't actually cover the full range of potential returns. So that's having a little think about the range that we're going to put into our sensitivity table. But there is another issue with sensitivity tables, and that's that they are symmetrical. So they're basically based around, you know, a, a rectangular shape. Well, what that implies is that the permutations of rental growth and exit yields, basically all of the boxes, are of equal likelihood. So in this case, we've got a three by three matrix 
So that would imply that each of these boxes has an 11% chance. So nine times 11 or 11.1% would, would come out at 100%. So let's have a little think about that. I mean, is that correct? Is, is actually all of these outcomes uh, as likely as each other? So going back to our empirical data, what we found is actually some outcomes were more likely than others. So this gives you the counts of where we saw different observations. So here's our minus four to plus four. So it's retail going back to the year 2000 and, and rolling five year periods. And then there's our yield movement minus eight to eight. Now, what you can see here is there's actually a line. So the most common are around the sort of eights and sixes, they're sort of in the middle. And then we've got a line through that. And that suggests that there is a relationship between your outcome for rental growth and your outcome for yield movements. Now, we also asked this uh, on LinkedIn. So we, uh, we asked people what they thought and did they think that combinations had equal or likelihood? And uh, the answers were great. So on LinkedIn, you're a little bit restricted in what you can ask. So uh, so the most likely two, um, stronger growth and lower yield. So this is the idea that you get basically good outcomes happening more likely than sort of one good and one bad. So it's a bit like today, we're seeing yields rise and we're also seeing very weak rental growth. Um, you could counter that to me. You could say, well, industrials, rental growth is very strong, but the yield's moving out. Um, and that would be true. And that's why it's important to recognize that, yes, we're saying things are, are less likely, but we're not saying that, that they're impossible in, in any stretch of the imagination. The other thing, interesting thing is that a lot of people voted for the fact that the average growth in yield movement is the most likely. And that's also true as well, because actually you are quite weighted towards the middle in terms of the likelihood. So what do I mean by that? Well, we'll, we'll basically try and redraw our sensitivity table to take into account um, the distribution and the correlation. And if we do that, we think it will show more visually how risky the investment actually is. So let's just take a couple of moments just to think about distributions. Um, for those of you uh, uh, still studying, you might be studying statistics and, and, and know all about distributions, but some of you, it might be a little bit more hazy in the past. Um, so what we're interested in is how these variables, in this case, rental growth and yield change, how they're distributed. But we're also interested in how they're correlated. So what is the distribution? So there's two things, basically, to a distribution. I'll show it visually. Um, we're basically um, interested in the um, central tendency. So where is the central point? And you've got sort of three measures of the central point. You've got the mean, i.e. the average, you've got the median, so sort of halfway through your distribution, and, and you've also got the most common. Now, if you've got a lovely symmetric distribution, hopefully there you'll recognise the, uh, the Gaussian normal distribution, then actually the mean, median and mode are the same. However, if you've got data which is skewed, so let's take the one where it's skewed to the left, then actually the mode, the median and the mean are different. So if it's skewed to the left, then you get more observations in a sort of peak here, and then you get this skew down to the left. And you get the opposite, of course, if you're skewed down to the right. I think our mean has drifted quite a long way to the right there. <laughs> Uh, not quite that far. So we're interested in, in what these distributions are to calibrate our sensitivity table. So the second point of the, uh, the distribution is the correlation. So are, are the two variables moving independently or are they correlated in some way? So correlation is basically a way of measuring uh, that relationship. And you get both positive correlations. So if it's a positive correlation, then when one variable rises, so here's a positive correlation. So when this variable is high, then your other variable is high. So that gives you a positive correlation. 
You can also have a, a negative correlation. So there, if you've got a high outcome for, in our case, rental growth, then you'd expect uh, a, a negative outcome on the yield. So that would be a, a negative correlation. Zero correlation is basically independent. They basically move independently of each other. They're not related uh, in any way, shape or form. So they're the things that we're interested in. And so we can we can look at those correlations and we can look at those distributions and then we can think about, well, how should we or how could we um, redraw our sensitivity table to take account of that? So what we found was we looked at the correlation and it is indeed negative and the negatives skew there at uh, point, well, point 0.6, so point 0.59. Now, what we then had to do was try and redraw our sensitivity table to take that into account. So now each of these boxes has been scaled, um, which took me quite a long time because it was quite a painful exercise. And it actually represents the percentage chance of any of the outcomes. So you can see that the, the middle outcomes, they're the most likely. So if you go back to that poll, that was one of the answers that people thought the middle was the most likely. So I would agree. Now, there is a skew on here, and I think you'd agree it's quite hard to see. So this is where we start to say, well, OK, we can redraw our sensitivity table. But actually, is it really showing us the skewness? It's quite a difficult thing uh, to see there. However, it's certainly an improvement. It's showing you that the central tendency here, so that around the zero uh, in both indices, there's a strong central tendency. And then the more extreme outcomes become less likely. And there is a bit of a, a, a skew to the data. So that would be an improvement. So you, you, you might go for that. Um, what we'd also like to do though, is maybe suggest that perhaps we should um, replace the sensitivity table um, with something else. Now, what would that something else be? Um, well, we would suggest uh, a histogram. Now, a histogram is also quite nice because it's also very visual. Um, and I'll just show you what a histogram looks like. So here's a histogram. Now, what I did here was I took our data on rental growth and yield movement. Um, and I put it into Excel. And I also basically asked for uh, a distribution that matched the skewness. So you can do that um, in Excel. And you can basically um, replicate what you've done in your sensitivity table. So I've got more outcomes than we had in our sensitivity table. And you can see we've still got this very strong since uh, uh, central tendency, which you would hope. It's not um, it's not perfectly normal, I think you'd agree, but there is definitely um, a sort of all the characteristics that are there of the normal distribution. We do have a little slight skewness, so we've got slightly more observations uh, on this side uh, than we do on that side. Now, Many of you out there might be thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. He's, he's showing a distribution um, and um, I know about distributions and um, we have to worry about distributions that they're actually mirroring the underlying. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, if, they, if they are actually conforming to a distribution. So that's the point. So what we want to do is we want to see this distribution and then we can actually get a really good feel for it. Um, so you can see here. For example, you can see the likelihood of extreme values. Um, it's relatively small, but it is there. And that's one of the nice things about having a histogram. But it does show you that being in the extreme um, is perfectly possible. So just because something happens which is unlikely doesn't mean uh, it's not possible. And I think the last few years has certainly shown that. So that's my sort of pitch for people to say, oh, maybe we shouldn't use sensitivity tables. Uh, maybe we should switch over uh, to using histograms.
Now, I've got to say that when we did the poll uh, before this presentation, uh, we got a rather strong result. Uh, so we got 30 respondents who favoured uh, a sensitivity table. And then we got one respondent favouring uh, a histogram. Uh, so I feel like I'm starting this presentation basically uh, 30 to 1 down. And it wasn't even my vote that voted for the histogram. Uh, so maybe we can add that. Maybe, maybe we can call that two. So why else might you think um, switching to a histogram uh, would be superior to the sensitivity table? Well, as I mentioned, if your distribution starts to conform to any kind of mathematical distribution, then you can start to use um, some very simple maths to start to do some further analysis. So what I've done here is I've basically redrawn uh, my histogram uh, as a normal distribution. So a normal distribution has many, many wonderful uh, mathematical characteristics. Now, that's nice, you know, making the maths easier. That's that's also not it, always nice. But what it also does is it starts to enable us to start to think about the asset in the portfolio context. So we can think about, well, OK, our sensitivity table was looking at one property and it looked at that property in isolation. But what happens when you're in the investment committee and somebody asks the classic question, well, well, what about the impact on the portfolio return? Well, suddenly the uh, the sensitivity table is is, is less than uh, flexible when it comes to that. Now, I can just illustrate um, one way of answering that question just by a simple illustration. So all I've done here is I've taken our distribution and I've labelled that the single property there. So here's our single property distribution. And then what I've overlaid is what if we had 10 of those exact same properties? So now we've got 10 properties rather than one property. What does that do to my distribution? Now you could imagine running your analysis, you know, set up your analysis, do 10 sensitivity tables and then add up all of those sensitivity tables and then represent that data as a sensitivity table. Yep. You could do that. Um, I have actually done that myself. Uh, it's very time consuming. And it's not as elegant, I don't think, as doing this. So here you can just use some very simple maths and you can basically represent your distribution for the 10 properties. And what that's basically doing is showing you that the more extreme outcomes are now less likely. So the way you can think about that is um, you can think about basically rolling a dice um, so if you were to roll two dice and look at the average score and compare that to just rolling one dice, you're much more likely to get uh, extreme results by rolling one dice than you are by rolling multiple dice. So what the histogram does is allow us to show that relationship. There are other ways, actually, of also showing it. This is, I think, quite a neat one. Now, that does raise quite an interesting question, because so far what I've done is I've presented figures based on the average rent and the average yield movement. So that data that I presented was a market average. It wasn't the range of individual property rental growth and yield movements, and they're far more likely to be much higher and much lower. So it does raise the question, well, is the actual sensitivity table, is that reflecting the range for individual assets? Or is that actually reflecting the range of my market average? And this was another question that we asked in the poll. Um, so if you are looking at the range of individual rental growth and yields, what you're basically measuring is the individual property risk. If you're using the market average rents and yields, what you're basically looking at is a diversified holding. So there you're looking at the portfolio risk. Now, it's quite interesting. Uh, the scale looks a bit misleading 
basically equally split. So that that's quite interesting as well, because when I've been in investment committees and um, we've shown sensitivity tables, you quite often have a discussion or we used to have discussions around the table with people saying, well, uh, you know, is this the portfolio or is this the individual asset? And should we be looking at the portfolio or should we be looking at the individual asset? And actually, there, there very rarely seem to be a consensus. Um, so one good thing is just to make sure that everybody's aware of, of which one you are doing, because there is a there is a choice. Now, one of the reasons why basically we've been doing this work um, is because we think it's quite hard to link a sensitivity table with asset allocation. We think that when people do their underwriting for an individual asset, the sensitivity table acts as a bit of a block. It sort of stops people from moving on and looking at their portfolio. So we think one way to basically unblock that analysis is to switch to uh, the histogram and that also allows us to do something else. It allows us to look at the correlation, not between rental growth and yields, but between rental growth and yields across groups of properties. So the easiest way to show that is I'll just show a classic correlation table. So here's our rental growth and here's our yield impact. And what you can see is the rental growth these correlations, we've actually got a negative correlation there because over the last sort of 20 years, because of the, the rise of internet shopping, we've actually seen strong industrial rental growth and, and weak retail rental growth. So that's showing through there as a negative correlation. So these correlations are quite low when it comes to rents. But when it comes to yields, you can see they're very, very high. So here we have some very high correlations. And that's because interest rates are a very high component of real estate yield. So when interest rates go up, actually the, the yield of all the sectors goes up. Similarly, when they go down. I've also shown on the bottom, just for completeness, the correlation there for the total returns. So what we basically um, think you can do is rather than showing a, a sensitivity table for the individual asset, we can basically use that information to share a sensitivity table for the whole portfolio. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to add in not just the distribution of individual property returns. We're also able to add in the number of properties that you've got in the portfolio in each sector and also those correlations between those sector returns. And that's what RES does when we do our asset allocation modeling and i'll just show you finally to to finish off what that actually looks like so you're basically showing your expected return here so we've got the return with sorry with the property over here and then without the property there so this property is expected to add to our expected return it's not going to make a, a huge amount of difference to the risk however it is improving the portfolio return per unit of risk. So it's increased there by 2.36 to 2.41. Now, I could have shown this on a histogram, which maybe I should have done, but actually I'll just sneak something in here just at the end. The other way we can show that is we can show it in terms of probabilities, because there is a bit of an issue that you know people in real estate, they're not used to talking about distribution, um, which is why I think the sensitivity table so positive but we can basically represent the data as a probability so here i've just taken two points so i've said what's the chance of being greater than a six percent return at the portfolio level so that might be the uh, the portfolio's stretch target and then what's the probability of falling below uh, the six percent return so what we can see is the probability is increased by having the asset and the probability of falling below, I think that actually should say 5%, not the typo, uh, has fallen to 13% from 14%. So that's another way of actually displaying the results, which I sort of sneaked in there at the end. But this is our idea for 
for a redesigned sensitivity table and, and this can work at the portfolio level.